Well, in the in the old in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, we have a villainess, uh, someone who is an evil queen. Who, if they made a Disney movie about her, you know, she would fit in right in with, in with uh, that that stereotype. Her name is Jezebel. Anybody heard of heard of Jezebel before? You know, um, Jezebel. She was so evil that her name has become synonymous with evil. You know, if someone says you're being a Jezebel or that person's being a Jezebel, we don't have to question what that means. We know that she's being e that person's being evil. And so we're going to look at Jezebel today, not just her life. We're going we're to read a little bit about her life, but we're going to learn about what the spirit of Jezebel is, because the spirit of Jezebel is just alive today, as it was back then. As long as there's been humans, there's been the spirit of Jezebel. And so we're going to look at what the spirit of Jezebel looks like uh, by studying her life. And so when we're first introduced to Jezebel, it's in 1 Kings chapter 16, and, and, it, and it's uh, in, in the context of her husband. Her husband is Ahab. It says, Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Naboth, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. So Ahab was the king of Israel, and if you know anything about the Israel and God's plan for them, the king of Israel was supposed to be the spiritual leader. He was supposed to be the spiritual leader of, the, of his people, and so usually as the king went, so did the people. They followed him spiritually. So Ahab, uh, he uh, abandoned his loyalty and his worship of the one true God, Yahweh, uh, because he married this woman named Jezebel, who was an idol worshiper. She worshiped Baal, and if you look at her father's name, his name is Ethbaal. And so he has, the he has the name of his God in his own name, Ethbaal, who worshiped Baal. So that tells us that, that Baal worship was deeply entrenched in her. It was, her, it was her family history. And so Ahab, this, this man who's supposed to be the spiritual leader of Israel, marries this pagan woman who worships Baal, and he follows suit to the point that he builds temples for Baal. So that's our introduction to Jezebel. Two, chapter late, two, chapter later, two chapters later, she's mentioned again. It says, while Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, fifty in each, and had supplied them with food and water. So not only was she zealous for her own, her own religion of Baal worship, she was so jealous, or so zealous, that she was killing off anyone who threatened that belief system. And so in this case, it was the prophets of God, the one true God, Yahweh. And so she was killing God's own prophets. And so that's our introduction to Jezebel. Okay, she's this, she's this uh, woman who is, uh, who is very uh, involved in, in her worship of Baal to the point where she's killing off God's own prophets. And so we're going to take her story in sections, and we're going to learn some things about what it means to have the spirit of Jezebel. And there, there's four things that I want to cover. And here's the first one. The spirit of Jezebel attacks, dominates, and manipulates the spirit of Jezebel is all about control. And so uh, we see that she's attacking, uh, attacking the prophets of God. And we're, we're going to read this story in uh, 1 Kings uh, chapter 21 that really gives us a glimpse into the wickedness of her heart. And it's a story about this man named Naboth, and he has a vineyard. It says this, sometime later there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth, the Jezreelite. The vineyard was in Jezreel, close to the palace of Ahab, king of Syria, Samaria. Ahab said to, Na Ahab said to Naboth, let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden, since it is close to my palace. In exchange, I will give you a better vineyard, or if you prefer, I will pay you whatever it is worth. But Naboth replied, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my ancestors. So Ahab went home, sullen and angry, because Naboth the Jezreelite had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my ancestors. He lay on his bed sulking and refused to eat. Boo-hoo, right? <laughs> Boo-hoo. I mean, at least he went about it in, a, in, a, in a, a reasonable approach. You know, he offered to pay the man what it was worth or give him something of equal or greater value. 
But he said, no. He said, this is my ancestral plot of land. I don't care to sell it. So, Na so uh, 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 Ahab, there we go. Ahab, sorry, Ahab was angry about it. Well, Jezebel gets involved, okay? This is where Jezebel gets involved. His wife Jezebel came in and asked, Why are you so sullen? Why won't you eat? He answered her, Because I said to Naboth the Jezreelite, Sell me your vineyard, or, in your, or if you prefer, I will give you another vineyard in its place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. Jezebel, his wife, said, Is this how you act as king over Israel? Get up and eat. Cheer up. I'll give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So then she hatches a very wicked plan. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, placed a seal on them, and sent them to the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth city with him. In those letters she wrote, Proclaim a day of fasting and seat Naboth in a, in a prominent place among the people. But seat two scoundrels opposite him and have them bring charges that he has cursed both God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. Nice, nice lady, huh? Okay. So, she, so she, forged, she forges letters in her husband's name using his seal uh, you know, to, to the, the leaders of this town and uh, saying, in other words, saying, uh, set Naboth up, uh, have some scoundrels falsely accuse him, and then stone him to death. And that's what happened. If you keep reading, that's what happened. That way she could get the vineyard for her, her husband. So it says, as soon as Je Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned to death, she said to Ahab, get up and take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, uh, Jezreelite, that he refused to sell you. He is no longer alive but dead. When Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he got up and went down to take possession of Naboth's vineyard. So someone with the spirit of Jezebel attacks, dominates, manipulates, cheats in order to get what they want, which is control. Control and, and uh, Ahab, as I said, he went about it in, a, in a, the right way. He offered the man uh, compensation uh, for it, and he said no. And so the wickedness of Jezebel took over. And what we see in this this story is something that's very key to understanding why people with the spirit of Jezebel get away with it for so long. And the reason that people with the spirit of Jezebel get a, get away with bad behavior for so long is because they play into what people want. Okay, let me say that again. They play into what people want. In this case, it was Ahab wanting the vineyard. And so she hatched her evil scheme to get that vineyard, and he turned a blind eye to her, to her approach, to her bad behavior. And so usually there are people like Ahab who enable someone with the spirit of of Jezebel. They surround themselves with yes people who, who, uh, who will not say no to them because they, they use those people to do their bidding. And they end up uh, as enablers instead of people who are willing to stand up to someone with a spirit of Jezebel. I think of our, our country's history and I think of President Nixon. He, he surrounded himself with the yes people. Okay, He had 12 of them, 12 men. Twelve men who did his bidding. And uh, when things turned criminal, those men did everything they could to, to protect Nixon, you know, and until they couldn't protect him anymore. And then all the, the cards came crush, crashing down. And, and the reason that they protected him is because he was protecting them. He gave them a place as a position of power, of influence, money, and they won that for themselves. And so they were willing to allow this powerful man to do things that were illegal. And so that's the key for a lot of people who have the spirit of Jezebel is that they surround themselves with yes people who they will do things and favors for. James 3.16 says, Where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find discord in every evil practice. Every evil practice when it comes to selfish ambition. When someone is selfish and they're ambitious for their own agendas, they will usually stoop to the lowest places to get that done and they will use people and surround people with yes people who will do their bidding for them and so the spirit of Jezebel someone who attacks dominates manipulates um, intimidates in order to get what they want which is ultimate control and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each of these aspects of the spirit of Jezebel and I'm going to compare it with the spirit of Christ 
Because as believers in Jesus Christ, we are to be like Jesus, right? We have Christ in our name, Christian. So the spirit of Christ is, is the opposite. It's surrender, sacrifice, and servanthood. Surrender, sacrifice, and servanthood. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. Jesus uh, served the hungry. He, Jesus healed the sick. It says this in Philippians 2, verse 3 and 5. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And so, unfortunately, um, uh, we have in every aspect of society, we have people who have the spirit of Jezebel. And that includes the church, historically. And so it's important that as believers in Jesus Christ, we model that. And not model or tolerate someone who has the spirit of Jezebel. Back in the 1800s, uh, there was a, in New York City, there was a politician named Boss Tweed. I don't know if you've ever heard of Boss Tweed. He was the third largest uh, landowner in New York City. He sat on the boards of just about every bank, and he was the most corrupt man you could ever imagine. And uh, he, he got his power through bribery. I mean, he would spend millions of dollars bribing people. And his famous quote was, the way that you get power is you take it. That was his famous quote. Okay, that's someone with the spirit of Jezebel. Someone who who uh, uses other people, who bribes people, who dominates, who manipulates people in order to get control. So that's, that's the first attribute of someone like Jezebel. Here's the second one. The spirit of Jezebel causes fear, flight, and discouragement. They have such a personality and such a strong personality, and they're, they're so intimidating that they'll, that they'll cause fear, flight, and discouragement. And so uh, one of the more famous stories of, the, of, of this, uh, of Jezebel, is, uh, is when um, the prophet Elijah comes in and he confronts her about her Baal worship and about leading all the Israelites to, uh, astray. And they have this contest on Mount Carmel, you know, where, they, where, where uh, Elijah tells the, the, the prophets of Baal to call down fire from heaven. And so they spend all day, you know, praying and nothing happens. And then Elijah gets up there and fire comes down from heaven, Okay. And so when fire comes down from heaven, then he, he tells them to kill all the, the prophets of Baal. So that gets back to, uh, to, back to Jezebel. It says, now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a message to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. In other words, by this time tomorrow you're going to be dead. So Elijah was afraid, and he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. And he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. Have you ever had someone in your life that just wants to make you, just want to make, make you feel like you want to die? You know, whether it be a boss, you know, if you ever had a horrible boss or a co-worker or maybe even a family member or someone who's in your life that they, they're just, that, they just poke you all the time, you know, and they just, oh, you just want to die. Uh, a church that I used to be on staff on, as soon as I got there, people started telling me about this lady. And they said, oh, you got to watch out for her because she'll, she'll bite your head off. You know, that's what they'd tell me. Oh, she'll, you don't cross her or she'll bite your head off. And sure enough, it didn't take very long before I crossed her and she bit my head off, okay? And, uh, and um, the pastor at the time said, well, when I came here, this is how someone said it to me about her. They said, she's like a fly and that she won't harm you, but she'll make you feel like you want to die. How's, the, how's that as a description of someone within the church, okay? This is someone who had the spirit of Jezebel who, was, who would just, you know, bully people and yell at people and, and just bite your head off if, if, if you did something to, that she didn't like, okay? Elijah here, he's, he's had enough, he says. Take my life, I've had enough. And this is God's response. And the word of the Lord came to him. He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, 
and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me. I think, uh, you know, I've always wondered, you know, why Elijah, after having this miraculous fire come down from heaven, why he would suddenly turn, turn and, 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 you know, and run and be afraid for his life. And as I was reading this, I think the key to under, understand that is the last sentence there where he says, I am the only one left. I am the only one left. I think what was working in Jezebel's favor with intimidating Elijah was isolation and loneliness. Isolation and loneliness is it's a tool of the enemy to defeat you, to discourage you, to make you feel like you want to die. When you are lonely and isolated, you can easily become discouraged and want to give up. You can easily be bullied and intimidated by another person when you feel like it's all you and no one else. You're all alone. And the spirit of Jezebel looks for such people to abuse and to bully. Oftentimes, someone with the spirit of Jezebel will befriend a lonely person only to use them uh, for their own selfish gain. And, and when they have control over the person, they can easily uh, uh, intimidate them and scourge them. Usually with school kids, you know, usually it's the boy or girl who's a little bit of the loner. You know, they're the ones that get bullied because they're isolated. And that's why it's important that you and I as believers in Christ, that we surround ourselves with like-minded people, that we surround ourselves with family, spiritual family. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says a cord of three strands is not easily broken, okay? A cord of three strands, like-minded people intertwined in their lives together to support one another. And if you keep reading on that story, you know, Elijah says, I'm the only one left, and so God brought up three friends to surround him, to support him and his loneliness and his discouragedness, uh, in his discouraged state. Loneliness and isolation is, is also a very dangerous place for a pastor to be. Any pastor will tell you that the, the ministry can be very lonely. It can be very lonely uh, and isolating. And uh, a lot of pastors are pushed into despair because they feel like they don't have anyone there for them. You know, and they're, they, they're pushed to a place of despair of wanting to give up. So the spirit of Jezebel causes fear, flight, and discouragement. There are bullies. Uh, they use bully tactics to intimidate people. But the spirit of Christ is encouraging, welcoming, and supportive. When I was thinking about this, th th there was three, uh, three stories that came to my mind of Jesus being encouraging, welcoming, and supportive. First one is uh, Zacchaeus, the wee little man, you know, climbed up in a sycamore tree. Uh, the, se the second story was the, the Samaritan woman at the well. And then the third story that came to mind was uh, the woman caught in adultery. All three of those people had the exact same thing in common, in that they were social outcasts. They were throwaways uh, by their own people, by their own societies. Zacchaeus was hated by his own people because he was a tax collector working for the hated Romans. The Samaritan woman says that she was married six times, five or six times. She was uh, an outcast. The, of course, the woman caught in adultery. She was an outcast. Uh, she was uh, a victim of the re religious establishment who wanted to stone her to death. And, uh, and Jesus welcomes these people. He doesn't throw them away. He doesn't intimidate them. He doesn't discourage them. He welcomes them as Jesus has welcomed each of us. And so the spirit of Jezebel causes fear, flight, and discouragement. It attacks, dominates, manipulates. Here's the third one. The spirit of Jezebel often is in alignment with a religious spirit. Often in alignment with a religious spirit. And so we, we see that Jezebel is very, very religious. She's very zealous for her own belief system, for her, uh, for her um, worship of Baal to the point that she is killing off God's uh, prophets, but we read about uh, the name Jezebel later in Scripture and in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation opens up with seven letters to the seven churches in Asia, and uh, one of those churches is the church at Thyatira, and this is what the, Jesus says to the church at Thyatira. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. Now, he's not talking about Jezebel of the Old Testament. He's talking about a spirit of Jezebel. 
someone who has the spirit or an entity that has the spirit of Jezebel. He says, you tolerate the, that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. And so, she was very religious. Okay, she was very religious. The, the Jezebel of Re Revelation, very religious. And what we find, unfortunately, is that we find a lot of people who, who uh, veil their, their bad behavior in religion. Okay? Uh, be humans are humans. And we're always going to find the spirit of Jezebel in every aspect of society. But unfortunately, it's often found in the church. Historically, it's always been in the church where someone cloaks that bad behavior with religion and with the appearance of religion so that people are not suspicious, so that people, that their guards are down. And so, so much has happened in the name of religion that's abusive, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, financial abuse, you know, stealing money from the coffers of the church, personal attacks, meanness, bully tactics, backbiting, gossiping, on and on and on, done by people who are quote-unquote religious. Now, it leaves the watching world with a bad taste for anything that resembles organized religion. And our news stories are unfortunately filled with stories of clergy with their bad behavior. Usually it has to do with something with a moral issue. Sometimes you hear about a pastor who loses his church because of his personality. I read a story about a month ago that just, I still can't believe it. It's one of those stories that you just scratch your head. In Chicago, there was a pastor. He started the church in 1950. 2021, he was still the pastor there, 71 years later. He was 94. 94, still, still the pastor, okay? So he decides to retire. Well, I would think so, at 94, okay? And uh, so they find his successor, they hire his replacement, and they tell him, we're going to make you, you know, since you served all these years, we're going to make you honorary pastor, just a, you know, a title of respect, no, you know, no position of power or no pay or anything like that. And he said, no, that's not good enough. He said, I, I want to be a pastor on staff who gets a salary. And they're like, well, that's not what we had in mind. You know, you're 94, you know, it's time for you to retire. And, and he caused such a stink that he, went, start, he launched a campaign to undermine the new pastor, his, new, his ministry, uh, slandering and causing all kinds of problems, trying to harm the church that he spent 70 years as the pastor. And it got so bad that the church voted unanimously to kick him out of their fellowship. Can you imagine? This is a man who was all about control, and he did not want to let go of control even after 70 years of being the pastor there. That's the spirit of of, of religion, of the spirit of Jezebel cloaked in religion. And there's, there's other stories that to, in recent years there's been, there's been two high-profile radio pastor teachers who have been fired from their church because of bullying, uh, bully tactics, uh, because uh, they, uh, they would intimidate and scare people and threaten people. And finally the church said, hey, our church is, our church is successful, but man, you, no one can tolerate you. And so they, would, they fired both of them, one in Seattle, one in Chicago. And so it's unfortunate that many people cloak their bad behavior in religion. And Jesus' complaint to the church at Thyatira is that the church was tolerating it. That the church was tolerating that spirit of Jezebel that was leading people astray. Just as the Jezebel of First Kings was leading the people of Israel, along with her husband Ahab, or leading them astray. And perhaps the, the church at Thyatira was tolerating this because they saw this as a religion, you know, as a religious aspect, and they gave it a pass. But we are called to stand up to that religious spirit, and usually when you do, usually when you stand up to someone with a spirit of, of Jezebel, you're in for a fight because they're going to go down swinging. They're not about to give it up. Um, my first experience in ministry, my very first church that I was on staff, I, I, a church hired me part-time to be their music pastor. And as soon as I got there, uh, the piano player did everything she could in her power to destroy my ministry. 
She had been the, the music person for 20-some years, and she saw me as a threat. And so from the day I got there, she did everything she could to undermine me, to, to destroy my ministry. It got so bad that I had to get the, the elders involved. They warned her. They said, we will kick you off the worship team if you don't get your act together. So she, she had, got her act together for, for a while, and then, then it went back you know, to where she was. She was a bully. Uh, that's, that's really what she was. She bullied me did everything she could to it, tried to intimidate me, to undermine me, and, and finally it got to the point where it became, it became obvious that I needed to remove her from playing the piano. And here's the thing, she was by far the most gifted musician at that church. And so I remember I called up her husband, I said, I'm going to come over, I need to come over and, and to your house and, and have a talk. And driving over to that house, that 20-minute drive was the, about the worst 20 minutes of my life as I had a lump in my stomach, knowing that I was about to enter into a battle. And I had to confront her, and I said, we have given you warning after warning after warning. It is, obviously is not working. I am dismissing you from the worship team. And uh, when that happens, be, be, be prepared for a fight, you know. But when, when, once you get rid of that person, once you get rid of that person who's so divisive, and the Word of God says get rid of the divisive person, once you've eliminated them, it's like, whew, you know, it's like a, weight off your shoulder. And as long as there's going to be churches, there's going to be people who, within those churches who have the spirit of Jezebel, who uh, causes fear and flight and discouragement. They use bully tactics. They're, they attack people. They dominate. They manipulate. They intimidate. They slander. Uh, my first, uh, when I was at seminary, one of my professors, he, had, he was a pastor as well, and he said that early on in his ministry, he had a lady in his church who was a gossip. And it got to the point where it was prob problematic. And so he called her into his office, confronted her about her gossip, showed her some scripture, you know, it talks about gossip. She jumped up and said, I don't care what that book says, and stormed out. And he said, at that moment right there, I realized she's not even a believer. You know, no, no believer would say, I don't care what that book says. And so we have to be aware that within the church, we have people who masquerade as believers, masquerade in the cloak of religion, but at their core, at their core, they have the spirit of Jezebel. And it's important that we stand up to them, whether it's uh, in, in the church, whether it's in uh, the school system, whether it's at your workplace, whether it's in politics, we cannot tolerate someone who has the spirit of Jezebel, who uses those tactics in order to gain control. We are to be Jesus. We are to be Jesus. Servants, sacrificial, surrendering. We are to welcome those who are on the fringes of society and welcome them into our midst. We must reject the spirit of Jezebel, knowing that when we do, we're inviting a fight, like I said. We must stand up to someone with the spirit of Jezebel, even when they may be in your corner. And this is really important, even if they may be in your corner. And that's what, how Ahab failed. He failed to stand up to her because she was in his corner doing her, his bidding for him. It's especially hard to stand up to the spirit of Jezebel when that person is in our corner because by doing so, you may be denying your own self-interest, but for the sake of, 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 uh, of integrity and Christian character, we must stand up to it. Godly character and integrity demands that we do that with the word of God as our weapon and the spirit of God as our power. And ultimately, this is, this is the fourth aspect Ultimately, the spirit of Jezebel, um, re they reap what they sow, ultimately. They reap what they sow. What comes around goes around. Another, another way of saying it is you live by the sword, you die by the sword, okay? And so we, uh, we see how this ends for Jezebel. It says uh, in Galatians chapter 6, it says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. And so this is what happens to her. She reaps destruction. It says in 2 Kings, it says the, uh, God decides to get rid of Ahab. He's too wicked of a king, so he replaces him with a, a, man, a man named Jehu. And it says the prophet poured the oil on Jehu's head and declared, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anoint you king over the Lord's people of Israel. You are to destroy the house of Ahab, your master, 
and I will avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the Lord's servants shed by Jezebel. So the whole house of Ahab will perish. I will cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. As for Jezebel, dogs will devour her on the plot of ground at Jezreel, and no one will bury her. And so this new anointed king, Jehu, he goes to Jezreel to find Je uh, Jezebel. It says uh, that when Je Jehu went to Jezreel, when, when Jezebel heard about it, she put on eye makeup, arranged her hair, and looked out a window. As Jehu entered the gates, she asked, Have you come in peace? He looked up the window and called out, Who is on my side? Who? Two or three eunuchs looked down at him. Throw her down, Jehu said. So they threw her down, and some of the blood splattered the wall and the horses as they trampled her underfoot. And she was, her body was eaten by dogs. It says that all that was left of her was her skull and her, hand and her hands and her feet. What comes around goes around. The spirit of Jezebel will ultimately reap what they sow. And it's important that, you po that I point out something here. It was her own people, her own servants, who threw her out the window. Okay? It was her, she had two or three eunuchs, you know, her, her aides, who were, who, were, who were there. And all they had to hear from Jehu was throw her out. And they did. And what that tells us is that when things start to tighten for someone with the spirit of Jezebel and they start feeling the heat, their alliances will flee because there's no dedication and commitment there. Their alliances will flee, friendships will fail, people will turn on them just like that because they're not their friend because they love them or because they care about them. They're friends because they're there to get what they want out of them. And so the moment that those two or three eunuchs realized that she's not as powerful as she used to be, all it took was, hey, why don't you throw out the window? And that's what they did. That's what they did. So usually someone with the spirit of Jezebel Friendships are fleeting. Alliances fail often. Secondly, someone with the spirit of Jezebel is an enemy of God. And God will go to war against them. Thus the title of my, this sermon series. God will only tolerate that kind of wickedness for a while before he takes it up and goes to battle for, with them. And so, to conclude... It's important that as we believers in Jesus Christ that we're able to recognize, recognize when someone has a spirit of Jezebel, when we recognize if they're in our midst and they cause division that it is confronted and dealt with, that we do not tolerate it. As Jesus said to the church at Thyatira, do not tolerate this woman. She leads people astray. It's important that we don't tolerate it even when they're in our corner doing our bidding for the sake of integrity and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we rid that out of our body, it makes the church so much healthier and whole. It makes the church so much more welcoming and inviting. When people know that they can come and they're not going to be judged, they're not going to be bullied, they're not going to be intimidated, but they're going to be loved, as we are called to do. Amen. So thank you, Lord, uh, for the, your word. God, we, we learn so many lessons, even when it's from a, someone as wicked as Jezebel. And I pray, God, just that uh, we take to heart uh, what's said about her, that we take heart the words of Jesus that says, do not tolerate such a person. God, uh, that person with a spirit of Jezebel will infiltrate the, the church as it often has, and it will affect your spirit and the spirit of a bond, a bonding with other believers cause division. And I pray, God, that we pray and we strive for a pure bride who seeks your will and your love always to demonstrate it and to live it out. And I pray this in your name. Amen.